I'm Ace Furman, and I go to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I was working on atomic structure, specifically of uh, lead 2. That's what we're working on down in the, um, in the accelerator lab. Um, and I'm working with uh, Rick and Dave. Um, so, um, quantum mechanics is really important in atomic structure, so I'm going to go over some of the basic stuff here just to give some context. Um, here are some of the basic quantum numbers that we use um, when we're talking about the electrons within an atom. N just basically is the energy of that electron to its first approximation. L is the angular momentum associated with the orbit around the nucleus. And S is the angular momentum associated with the spin of the electron. Um, and when we talk about atoms, we usually talk about the configuration of the electrons within the atom. And so uh, when we talk about that configuration, we talk about L with these letters. That's just the convention we use. So S is 0, P is 1, and so on. Um, so as an example, if we have neutral lithium, which has three electrons, um, the ground state, there would be two electrons in the 1s state, which means that the n value is 1, and the l value is 0, so we have an s. So there's two there, and then there's one in the uh, 2s um, level. And so for what we're doing, lead 2, there's also three electrons in its um, outer sh shell. The inner shell is pretty much closed, so we leave that off. Just start at six. Uh, we have two in the uh, 6s level and one in the p level for the ground state. Um, then once you move past the electrons, you can talk about the, the atom itself. Um, so we have a capital L for the total orbital momentum of the atom, and then capital S is the total spin momentum. And then we also have this J, which is um, basically the sum of the vectors, capital L and capital S. Um, so that's the absolute total angular momentum of the atom. And so we can talk about its LS coupling, um, which you just write like this, is um, two times the total spin plus one um, in the superscript, the L value, and then the J value in the subscript. So for the ground state of lead two, the S is one half, L is one, J is one half, so we can write it like this, um, and we call that a doublet because the spin is two, if it were three, it'd be a triplet. Um, and so this is important because when we talk about LS coupling, it comes with lots of uh, rules um, about how they can transition. And um, according to Ellis coupling, there are some transitions that are forbidden, specifically when the spin of the, of the uh, atom changes from a doublet to something else, um, or from anything else to anything else. Um, and, but it's important to note that this is only an approximation. Ellis coupling doesn't uh, always apply when um, the approximation isn't necessarily that good. Um, specifically, I'm looking at a, a state, a quartet P state, that shouldn't be able to decay uh, down to the um, doublet P state according to uh, Ellis coupling, but it does. And we have measurements that it does. Um, and so, I will show you why. Um, so, like I said, it's just an approximation. Actually, every state is a combination of lots of different states. Um, like, for example, this state in lead 2, is, uh, we call it a doublet D because the, the biggest contribution is from this doublet D state, but it also has contributions from other states that um, to some degree. And um, just to note that the, if they're going to have mixing, they have to have the same J value. 
So what I'm actually doing um, is using graphs 2 k which is a simulation program that um, can calculate energies and mixing coefficients and things like that. And I'm using what we call an isoelectronic series, which is when you take uh, the amount of electrons and fix it at 81, which is true for uh, lead 2, and um, then vary the atomic number. Um, and basically that gives you a context for um, why lead 2 might be um, showing certain qualities. And so I made this chart, which basically uh, starts at thallium and goes all the way to uh, uranium. And these are the energy levels uh, with respect to the ground state for all of these different um, states. And I realize this is a pretty boring graph because there's nothing that really happens except right here. So I just <laughs> zoomed in on it. And um, this is interesting because you have my quartet P state, both the three halves and the five halves state for J values. Um, and they both are really, really close to this doublet D state. Um, and this is important because um, according to this uh, equation I have here, when the energy states are really close together, like they were, um, the mixing coefficients um, are really big. So, what's going on here is right at lead, where, where we saw the energies were really close, there's a spike in uh, the doublet D state, which can decay because it's a doublet, down to the doublet P, which is brown. And so this is for the bypass state. That's why, specifically at lead, we see that the quartet P decays to um, the three halves state of the ground configuration. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'm also working uh, in the accelerator, and I showed this last time, but in case you forgot. Um, the way this works is we uh, shoot ions down here. It hits a uh, carbon foil, and they excite. Um, the ions excite to various states, and um, then when they de-excite, they give off a photon, and um, we detect the photons here. And we right now are looking at a specific state, the um, 1433 uh, state, their transition um, in lead two. And the way we um, hone in on that is we have a monochromator that's that selects out just that wavelength associated with that transition. Um, but there's actually um, one other thing that you have to select for, and that is um, sometimes what happens is you'll have, since there's, it excites to many states, uh, what will end up happening, I actually drew a picture of you here earlier, but um, you'll end up trying to look at this state coming down here, this transition, but there's maybe a higher energy state that decays to that state and then decays again. So you have, um, that'll skew the data. So to correct for that, um, well that's, that's what you call a cascade. That's um, when one cascades down into the, the level you're looking at. And um, so what you should have, if, the, if it were just the transition you're looking at, you should have a decay curve that looks exponential if you have um, the intensity here and the time on the x-axis. It should be a single exponential model. But um, what we end up seeing is that it's not um, due to these cascades. And so the way we correct for this is called A and DC. And um, basically, in this equation, we take the, um, the rate of change of the amount of, amount of ions in the state you're looking at. And then here, you basically have to see that there's some leaving the state, um, where alpha is the probability that they'll decay, and n are the number of ions in that state. And that's what it should be if 
there's no cascade effect. But what happens is there's also a term that uh, represents the ions that are coming into that state where A is the probability of the cascades decaying and N is the number of them. So then, if you just represent these um, populations as intensities, you end up with this equation. And since we can measure these intensities um, in the lab, this is a known value, this is a known value, and this is a known value. Plus, this is the intensity of the cascade. And through literature searches, we can find um, the data on that. So then, we can treat this as one known value, y of t, and this as a known value, x of t. So if there's only one cascade, which is what we believe is going on in our data, you end up with this equation, which is linear, which is great. Because when you plot your data, um, you can look for the uh, y-intercept, and that's your alpha. And uh, it's also important to note that alpha, which is the probability that it will decay, is the reciprocal of your mean line, which is our final um, goal. So, um, we ran some ANDCs, actually, um, the grad student I'm working with, Nagar, ran um, just a basic ANDC and found that um, the mean life for our state is um, about 1.4 nanoseconds. But I um, went a slightly different route. I did a Mathematica uh, module for a single cascade. And um, after it performed the ANDC, it um, iterated over a, a range of possible mean lives for the cascade, assuming that the, uh, the one that we saw in, um, in the literature search wasn't necessarily the best one, because it's not. Uh, necessarily confirmed right yet. So um, I'll just briefly show you. Here's the module that I made. And uh, oh, can you not see it now? That's OK. Essentially, here's the data. You fit it. And here is what I modeled as the contribution of the cascade. And to remove that, Here's my ABC plot. Sorry that part of it's getting cut off, but this is that y of t that I had earlier, and this is the x of t. And if you look, after iterating, it got really, really linear. And so if you just find the um, y-intercept, it came out to be um, 1.29, which is cut off here, but that's what it says. Um, so after iterating, it actually decreased the value um, of the mean line. Um, from what we had uh, before iterating. And also, I'm working on a multiple uh, cascade module, which uh, is a little bit more complicated and not finished yet, but that's what I'll be working on in the future. Any questions? <laughs> anything other than a first order result or a second order in the case of cascades might be difficult. That's true. Um, but the other route um, would be just doing a uh, multiple exponential fit with um, you know um, well when you're doing multiple, multiple exponential fit uh, 
the exponential terms are not a orthonormal basis, so it's not very um, it's not a very accurate measure of the uh, mean lives to do it that way. And comparatively, this is a little bit more accurate. Um, I'm not sure of any other method of going about this. So yeah, it is an approximation. But. Um. Another question, like from the beginning part, so this mixing happens when these energy levels are really close. Have we like found all of the times that these are close for various ions, or are there still ones that need to be tripped upon in atomic structure land to like find when this mixing can occur? Um, Do you just this is like totally general because I don't yeah, know this yeah. sort of stuff. Well, I definitely haven't found all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm sure that there's more out there, okay. but I know that there's a great deal of them. But I think that, yeah, there's, 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 there's always. 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 There